From September through November of 2023, the CH Booth Library participated in the Yiddish Book Center's Stories of Exile Reading Groups for Public Libraries program. Stories of Exile is a reading and discussion program created to engage teens and adults in thinking about experiences of displacement, migration, and diaspora. Using the work of the Yiddish authors Yen Tamash, Hava Rosenfarb, and Jacob Glatstein as a portal, this series of programs explored narratives and stories from across the globe which grapple with questions of homelands, journeys, identity, and belonging. This exhibit, then, was a celebration of Yiddish culture, of literature, music, and history, and their creators' contributions to the exploration of the human experience, while also serving as an example of the persistence and resilience of the human spirit, despite the many challenges and adversities faced by people around the world. Yinda Mosh drew on her own experience of multiple uprootings to tell stories that trace an arc across continents, across multiple upheavals and regime changes, and across the phases of a woman's life from girlhood to old age. Yinda Mosh was born in 1922 in a small town or shtetl in the southeastern region of Europe, then known as Bessarabia. While she was growing up, the area was renowned as a lively center of Jewish culture. Today it lies within the nation of Moldova, just east of Romania. In 1941, when Mosh was 19, she and her parents were condemned by the Soviets as bourgeoisie elements, enemies of the people, and transported east along the thousands of others, both Jews and non-Jews. Her father was imprisoned in a camp in the Ural Mountains. She and her mother were sent to a special settlement deep in the Taiga on the Ob River. The deportation saved them from being murdered by the Nazis, but it was nonetheless a terrible fate. Both of Mosh's parents died during this period of extreme privation and hunger. In 1948, after seven years of hard labor, Mosh left Siberia. She married and made her way to the city of Kishnev, not far from her girlhood home, which was now the capital of the Moldovian Soviet Socialist Republic. In 1970s, emigration opened up for Jews, and Mosh went to Israel. There, now in her 50s, she began to write down what had been so long hidden inside, After 35 years, she finally spoke about the traumatic things that had happened to her and about the destroyed world of her youth. As she put it, in Israel, the new atmosphere blew away layers of ash and uncovered the spark that had flickered but never gone out. I began to describe a world that had been destroyed but would not allow itself to be eradicated. Her short stories were published in Yiddish journals on both sides of the Atlantic, and her work was collected in four volumes, Deep in the Taiga in 1990, A Change of Place in 1993, Bessarabian Themes in 1998, and The Last Time Around in 2007. She was honored with Israel's Itzik Munger Prize in 1999 and the Dovid Hofstein Prize in 2002. Mosh died in Israel in 2013. Hava Rosenfarb is considered one of the most important Yiddish novelists of the post-war period. Born February 9, 1923 in Lodz, Poland, Rosenfarb was incarcerated with her family in the Lodz Ghetto. When it became clear that the Lodz Ghetto was to be liquidated in August of 1944, Rosenfarb and her family all hid in the second room of the Rosenfarb's ghetto apartment behind a door that was hidden by a wardrobe. They were discovered by the Nazis two days later on August 23, 1944, and deported to Auschwitz. At Auschwitz, the knapsack containing Rosenfarb's poems was ripped out of her hands and thrown on a pile to be discarded. During the selection for life or death, Rosenfarb claimed that her mother was in reality her elder sister, and in this way she managed to save her mother's life. From Auschwitz, Rosenfarb, her mother and sister were sent to a labor camp where they were put to work building houses for the bombed-out Germans of Hamburg, and then eventually to Bergen-Belsen. There, Rosenfarb contracted typhus, and on the very day when the British Army liberated the camp in 1945, she was lying near death. The British transported her to a lazarette outside the camp, where she slowly recovered. When she regained her strength, Rosenfarb and her sister traveled the German countryside seeking news of their father, whom they had last seen at the train station in Auschwitz. After weeks of fruitless searching, Rosenfarb learned that her father had died in the last transport out of Dachau, when the train on which he and the other inmates had been riding was bombed by the Americans. In 1945, Rosenfarb, her mother and sister, crossed the border illegally into Belgium, where she lived as a displaced person, supporting herself as a teacher at the Women's Circle Yiddish School. Rosenfarb migrated to Montreal in 1950, where she resumed her nascent literary career. Though she began as a poet, she found that neither poetry nor drama could begin to express the range and depth of her feelings about the Holocaust. Rosenfarb turned to fiction. In 1972, she published in Yiddish, The Tree of Life. This monumental three-volume epic chronicles the destruction of the Jewish community of Lodz during World War II. 
It is one of the few novels, as opposed to memoirs or autobiographies, to be written by an actual survivor of the Holocaust. Rosenfarb had two children with Henry Morgenthaler, a daughter Goldie and a son Abraham. In 2006, the University of Lethbridge bestowed on Rosenfarb her first university degree, a doctor of laws, making her the first Yiddish writer to be honored in this way by a Canadian university. Hava Rosenfarb died January 30, 2011. Her archive can be found at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto. Jacob Glatstein was one of the preeminent Yiddish poets, novelists, and public intellectuals of the 20th century. Glatstein was born on August 10, 1896, in Lublin, a mid-sized Polish city that was home to a large and illustrious Jewish community. He grew up as part of a sprawling family with literary and artistic leanings, especially on his father's side. At age 13, he traveled to Warsaw to visit the eminent Yiddish writer I.L. Peretz. It is likely that he was writing even at that age. Glatstein's emigration from Poland, a response to rising anti-Semitism and brutal economic conditions, took place in the spring of 1914, just months before the outbreak of World War I, and his own 18th birthday. Upon arriving in New York, where he joined his father's youngest brother, Glatstein did what many new immigrants did. He worked in sweatshops, studied English, and struggled to get by. By 1918, he had learned enough English to enroll in law school at New York University, though he would find that law was not his calling. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Glatstein, though not particularly famous, was one of the most creative and energetic forces in New York Yiddish literature. His poetry from this period burst with life and experimentation, and then in the summer of 1934, 37-year-old Glatstein boarded a transatlantic ship for Europe to visit his dying mother. From New York, he sailed to France, traveled by train to Paris, crossed through Nazi Germany, and stopped in Warsaw before continuing on to his hometown of Lublin. After his mother's death, he spent several weeks recuperating before making the return voyage to New York. When he returned from Poland in the mid-1930s, it was apparent that the trip had marked a turning point in his creative life and career. Upon returning to America, Glatstein planned to turn the material from his voyage into three books, with the third focusing on the trip back to the United States. The reason why he never finished the trilogy is unknown. It is possibly the Holocaust, to which Glatstein devoted many powerful poems, including Goodnight World, that made the conclusion impossible. Whatever the explanation, Glatstein's trip to Poland, his return to the United States, and the Holocaust had a transformational impact on his work. Whereas he had once been a consummate modernist, embracing the possibilities of universalist experimentation, he now became a passionate advocate for the Jewish people in Yiddish. In the final decades of his life, Glatstein saw his greatest fame and recognition, even as Yiddish and his readership declined. His work was translated not only in English and Hebrew, but also Russian, Spanish, and French. Although he is primarily remembered as a Yiddish poet, he was also celebrated as one of the language's finest essayists and critics. Glatstein died on November 19, 1971, at his home in Elmhurst, Queens. How did they make a living, Len Glick is quoted as wondering in Aaron Lansky's Outwitting History. What did they teach their children? What did they eat? What did they read? What stories did they tell? What songs did they sing? What was the relationship between men and women? In short, Len Glick was wondering about culture and the full constellation of human experience. Those ideas are considered in the work of all three authors that are the program's focus, but our goal was to show tangible examples of that culture as a whole, like this journal of words and photos that ran in Warsaw, Poland from 1923 to 1928. This magazine featured pieces from prominent writers of the time among richly illustrated pages, it published gossip, world news, articles about the arts and entertainment, alongside philosophical pieces and contests to decide which was the most beautiful Jewish child in Poland, as depicted here. As a part of that mission, we also chose to illuminate Yiddish poetry, music, and song. Avram Sutzkever was one of the 20th century's greatest Yiddish writers and leading voices of Yiddish poetry. Born in Smorgon, in a small industrial city southeast of Vilna, Avram Sutzkever spent his early childhood in Omsk, Siberia, where his parents took refuge from the invading German armies during World War I. Following the death of his father, the family resettled in Vilna in 1921. Sutzkever attended the Polish Jewish High School, audited university classes in Polish literature, and was introduced by a friend to Russian poetry, his earliest poems written in Hebrew. In 1941, after the Nazi invasion of Lithuania, Sutzkever was sent to the Vilna ghetto, where he became part of the legendary Paper Brigade, a group that hid and saved many of the city's Jewish literary treasures. In 1943, Sutzkever and his wife escaped the ghetto and joined a group of partisans, 
eventually making their way to the Soviet Union. Immediately following the war, he published two volumes about his experiences in the Vilna Ghetto, From the Vilna Ghetto and Poems of the Ghetto. He also served as a witness at the Nuremberg Trials, and two years later emigrated to Palestine. Sutzkever's post-war poetry and editorial influence are credited with stimulating a revival of Yiddish creativity in Israel and beyond. Contrary to the intimacy of most of his verse, Sutzkever assumed a public role, bringing far-flung Jewish communities to the message that Yiddish language and culture would continue to thrive. Sutzkever finally emerged as a national poet, addressing large historical subjects and works of epic scale, while creating deeply personal, sometimes idiosyncratic, contemplative verse. The series Poems from a Diary, 1974 to 1981, which is considered his masterpiece, fuses philosophical reflection, autobiography, and observation into a modern Psalter. Sutzkever's works have been translated into English, Swedish, French, Hebrew, Polish, and other languages, and has been called one of the great poets of the 20th century. In 1909, Jewish ethnographer, writer, and social activist Est Ansky came up with an initiative for a scientific event, an ethnographic expedition to the Pale of a Settlement Area. The aim of the expedition was to research the traditional culture of Eastern European Jews, to gather folkloric materials such as music and stories, history about the towns, Jewish heritage items for a future Jewish museum, and to take photos of people, places, and extraordinary buildings. Gathering of the folklore was not supposed to be, according to Ansky, just a documentation of the representative examples of traditional tales or songs. He did not want to create a model of a shetel. Instead, he wanted to preserve the diversity of Jewish culture, document each observed variable of folk creations, and make it available for interpretation and adaptation in the future. Among the experts who participated in the Ansky expedition was Zinovi Kieselhoff, a musician and participant in the Influential Society for Jewish Folk Music in St. Petersburg. Kieselhoff amassed a collection of cylinder sound recordings and transcriptions of Jewish folk songs, cantorial pieces, devotional melodies, and instrumental pieces. The music that you have been hearing throughout this presentation was Judith Shapiro performing a setting of Ava Rabba, a prayer or blessing recited during morning services, on violin from the Kieselhoff Makinovetsky Digital Manuscript Corpus. This performance was recorded live at the Great Synagogue in Bordeaux, France, on May 8, 2023, where she was joined by Christina Crowder on accordion. Thank you for watching and for supporting our library. This program series and exhibit was made possible by the Yiddish Book Center, along with generous contributions from the Friends of the C.H. Booth Library, patrons Sharon Cohen, Barbara Wojcik, and Doria Linitz. Additional assistance provided by Christina Crowder, Executive Director of the Klezmer Institute, Audio features of the physical exhibit were designed and created by Chris Beale.